Good morning and welcome to worship here at Mount Carmel Baptist Church. We are delighted that you have chosen to join us for this day and for this worship in this special occasion. It's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers out there. We're praying that you enjoy this day to its fullest, that you are showered with the gifts that you deserve and all of the fun that goes along with it. We also thank you for being a father to those here at Mount Carmel. Your presence means so much to us. So we wish you a happy Father's Day. I'm glad you also stopped before you decided to go out to dinner and all those great things because this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad therein. Amen. Amen. This is just such a great day. Would you please take a moment with me to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is here and in heaven. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the fathers that you have given us, for the role models that has helped shine away into our path. So God, along with honoring you, we honor them today. But more than that, God, we come here to lift your name on high, to worship you because you are worthy, to give you the praise because you are worthy, to lift our hands and declare that thou art God because you are worthy. So God, we ask that you would bless this time of sharing. And in this time that someone may come to know you even better, even those who already have a relationship with you, God, that those relationships go deeper and they, they grow with more meaning, God. So we ask that you would bless us. God, we pray that you would bless our pastor as he prepares to come before us and break the bread of life, that in this breaking of this bread that we will understand you and our purpose here on earth. God, that we would give to those who are in more need than, than what we have, God, and that we will share your word to all who are lost. It is in Jesus' matchless name we offer this prayer and all that goes along with it. And the church said, amen, amen. Once again, happy Father's Day. I'm just so excited. Uh, this is the day that all the dads and the men of the church get to celebrate and to be celebrated. At this time, I'd also like to just pause and say that we have a, a vibrant men's ministry here at Mount Carmel. And if you so choose to, to be a part of that, we meet every Thursday on Zoom at 7 o'clock. And if you want to be a part of that, please go to the church website get that information, and join us. We would love to have you to be a part of us. Now, our scripture today comes from Luke, the eighth chapter. Luke, the eighth chapter, verses 26 through 39. 26 through 39, Luke, the eighth chapter, verses 26 through 39. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And the word of God reads as thus. Then they arrived at the country of Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. As he stepped out on land, a man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time, he had worn no clothes and he did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. 
but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demons into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back to the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding. And the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the swine. And the herd rushed down the, the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran off and told the city and the country. Then people came out to see what had happened, and when they came to, to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is one of my great stories that I love to read in the Bible. At this time, we want to welcome all of our guests and friends and also the members of Mount Carmel Baptist Church. We welcome you into this service. If you do not have a church home, we invite you to join with us on the King's Highway as we draw closer to God in these times. Also, if this is your first time worshiping with us, would you please place a one in the chat so that we may welcome you personally. I want to remind you that the doors of the church are still open. We are still worshiping here on Sundays at 8 o'clock and 1045. If you desire to be here in person, we welcome you to come. We are observing all the protocols of COVID, and we are having a good time here. So once again, we welcome you to worship. We welcome you to worship. Let's take some time and just greet each other in the chat. If you would, say hello to someone. This is a great time. Put some hand claps in there. Put some praises in there. God has been good to us. All right? Great job, Mount Carmel. And now it's giving time. It is giving time. There are many ways in which you can give here at Mount Carmel Baptist Church. You can give through Givelify. You can also choose to mail in your offering to the church. 7237 Tucker C.G. Road, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28214. You can also choose to bring it here in person. We'll have someone here to receive it Monday through Thursday, 10 o'clock to 2. And there'll be someone here to receive your offering and your gifts. Also, if you so choose to, you can go to the Mount Carmel website, mcbaptist.org, and you can give there. If you will, with that offering in your mind or in your hand, let's go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for these gifts that we are about to give. We pray that they will be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom, God. They will be used to do those things that you have asked us to do, God, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked. And God, we're praying that as the weeks go by, that we can be of service to you with these gifts that are given through your people. God, I ask that you would bless the giver, the ones who give out of great of abundance and those who give out of great necessity, God. For we know that you can meet our needs. Your word says, try me and see. If I don't open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room to receive. And God, we trust in that word and we give. So with that, God, 
we offer you this gift. But more than that, God, we offer ourselves and our praise to you along with it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now, Mount Carmel, it's time to go higher in the Lord. It's time to get closer to God. As we prepare for our pastor to bring us the word of God, the music ministry is going to usher us into his presence with music and song. Amen. God bless you and enjoy your happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Enjoy your day. Good morning, beloved, and welcome to worship. Thank you for joining us and making Mount Carmel your church of choice. If I haven't had the privilege to greet you, I'm Pastor Kimbrough, and we're so excited to welcome you this morning. Let me extend a word of celebration to all of our fathers and grandfathers this morning. Let's just take a moment to thank God for them today and all they pour into our lives, our communities, families, and uh, extended family. And so again, put it in the chat. Uh, go ahead and send a shout out to your dad, to your father, and just thank God for their investment in your journey and in your life. All right, let's turn to James chapter 1. I'm just going to read verse number 5, James chapter 1, verse number 5. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter, being double-minded and unstable in every way, must not expect to receive anything from the Lord. That's James, the epistle of James, chapter 1, verse number 5. 
Let's pray together. Father, bless now this word as we share it. We thank you for the privilege to share it together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, beloved. And for our subject matter today, I want to talk with you, and particularly with all of our fathers as well, from the subject, Walk in Wisdom. Walk in Wisdom. Many of us recognize the epistle or the letter of James, authored by James, the half-brother of Jesus. The author of the epistle, James, never boasts or seeks to lift himself up based on his direct relationship with Jesus. In his own writing in chapter 1, verse 1, James identifies himself simply by describing himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a word there for somebody. Do not get caught up in the noise and the circulation of chaos that's around us. Keep yourself focused on the privilege that God has given you to serve. Fathers, serve and remember that you are called to serve and to serve in your family, your community, and across the nation. And most of all, you're called to serve God. Somebody type that in for me this morning. Serve God. Stay focused and serve God. For at our core, we are all being called to serve to make a greater contribution, to make a difference while we are able in the land of the living. Now, James, the half-brother of Jesus, he did not start out as a believer. As a matter of fact, he started out as a skeptic. I can only imagine as Jesus was traveling and healing and sharing and teaching in the ministry, his half-brother James was somewhat skeptical and aloof and did not initially participate in the movement known as the Jesus Movement. But eventually, James would become a great leader in the church, and it was the witnessing of the resurrection that turned James into a, from a skeptic into a believer. It was the resurrection that turned his life around. It was the resurrection that convicted him. And how many people, untold numbers, have been convicted by the resurrection, whose lives have been turned around? How many men, families, and fathers whose lives have been turned in a different direction at the witness of the resurrection of Jesus the Christ? We're told that James was one of the early witnesses of the resurrection. You can read that in 1 Corinthians 15 and 7. His conversation gives testimony to the overwhelming power that comes with being a witness of the resurrection. And so James's journey, James's life provides for us some important lessons that every believer and particularly every father ought to seek to live out. And those lessons are lessons of grace, humility, wisdom, and not to be double-minded, or I should say, to be faithful and stable. And so today I want to talk with you And I want to encourage you to walk in grace, walk in humility, walk in wisdom, and walk in faith and stability. Well, let's talk a little bit about grace. This letter is a letter of grace. Grace is simply God extending God's favor to us. Grace is what saves us in Ephesians 2.8. Grace is the essence of the gospel. Read Acts 20 and 24. Grace gives us the victory over sin. Read James 4 and 6. Great gives, uh, grace gives us not only inter- eternal encouragement, but also gives us great, great, gives us great hope. 
And so read 2 Thessalonians 2 and 6. And Christ Jesus becomes the embodiment of grace. And what a blessing grace truly is. I said, what a blessing grace truly is. Read Romans 5 and 8 and 10. God demonstrated his own love toward us in this. While we were yet still sinners, the scripture says Christ died for us. While we were God's enemy, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. That's grace. Somebody type it in. That's grace. That's grace. And it's grace that justifies. It's grace that provides access and communication and fellowship to God. It's grace that establishes our relationship and our intimacy with God. It's grace that disciplines and trains us and teaches us how to honor God. It's grace that gives us the spirit, immeasurable spirit of riches. It's grace that helps us in every need. And so one of the things we learn from James is that James learned that God's grace is uh, glorious, that God's grace is exceptional, and that in grace you can find God's exceptional love. As a songwriter would say, grace is amazing and amazing is grace. And that's the first thing I want to drop on our fathers this morning. I want to challenge you to walk in grace. That's right, walk in grace. And not only for you to walk in grace, but then to demonstrate as a funnel to others, to your family, to your wives, your children, your community, demonstrate God's grace to them. The second thing that James models for us is humility. James models for us humility. James, even though he's a blood relative of Jesus, he never takes this as an act of authority. James identifies himself as a servant. Somebody type it in, servant. James wants to be known as nothing other than a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, James was the son of Mary and Joseph, and therefore the half-brother of Jesus. And yet James, who would become a leader in the church of Jerusalem, James, who would be at the forefront of the church of Jerusalem, known as a peacemaker and known as a person of wisdom, it's James that they would report back to when they would go out and share the message. But in his humility, Humility, what does it mean? It means his lowliness of mind, his heart attitude, that he was humble enough to understand that he did not gain stature based on his relationship or connection with Jesus, but he simply wanted to be a servant of God. He practiced an attitude, an attitude that allowed him to obey God the Father and humble himself as a Christian, putting aside selfishness and being obedient to the word of God. And you do know that humility, true humility, true godly humility produces a godness, a godlike spirit. It produces commitment. It produces a security. It begins to work from the inside out when you are a person who walks in a spirit of humility. You do not seek to promote yourself. You want to simply be in service and serve as God would have you to serve. When Peter escaped prison, he comes back and reports to James about the miraculous escape in Acts in 12. The Jerusalem council convenes, and apparently James is the chairman of the council. We're told in Galatians that he's an elder in the church. He's a pillar. He's helping to hold literally that church up. He presides over the meetings in Jerusalem, and uh, this is after Paul's third missionary journey. James models for us. He plants the seed for us. He helps us to understand that not 
only, amen, not only do you want to have, not only do you want to have grace and walk in grace, but secondly, you want to make sure that you're walking in grace in a humble spirit, in humility. I, I like this. Uh, just think about the model of a seed. When you walk in humility, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going to go your way, but you can learn the lesson of the seed. And that means this, that at times you will be vulnerable, but no matter what you're going through, be you, be the best version of you, be your best self. Understand that like the seed, growth requires change. And so you have to keep growing. You have to keep evolving. You have to keep changing. And then remember to bloom or to grow where God plants you. So right in the midst of your community, right in the midst of your church, right in the midst of your family, right in the midst of your nation, you may be vulnerable at times, but when you walk in grace and when you walk in humility, then God will cover you. You will be your best self. Be your best self. Know that you're going to have to grow. And as you grow, you continue to change. You continue to mature and you grow and bloom where God has planted you. And so James says it this way. If any of you is lacking in wisdom, say wisdom, type in wisdom, ask God who gives it all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to you. But how do you ask? You ask in faith. You ask never doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter being double-minded, type in double-minded, and unstable in every way, must not receive anything from the Lord. And so he says, walk in grace, walk in humility, and thirdly, seek godly wisdom, not earthly wisdom, but godly wisdom. James is known as a person of wisdom. This book is known as a book of wisdom. The writer of Proverbs says, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. The, Bi the Bible urges us to seek wisdom above all things, Proverbs 4 and 7. There's a difference between God's wisdom and the world's wisdom. Read 1 Corinthians 3 and 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. And verse 20, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise are futile. So it's obvious there's a difference between godly wisdom and the wisdom of this world. The wisdom of this world designed to help you to gain things. But to learn God's wisdom, you have to invest yourself in the Word of God. Read Psalms 119, 119. You have to invest yourself. You have to seek understanding. No person is born all-knowing. No person is born wise. You have to acquire wisdom. You have to seek it from God. You have to hunger after it. He says if you seek it, you will find it. How do I get wisdom, pastor? You have to immerse yourself in the presence of God, in the presence of God's word. And it produces a heart of worship. Type that in, a heart of worship and a heart of thanksgiving. And a worshiping heart is a fertile soul for the growth of wisdom. It's the seed ground. It's the place where wisdom 
can grow. Pastor, what are you talking about? When I say heart, I'm talking about the seed of your consciousness, the center of your creation. I'm talking a place about the place where you live within yourself, not simply the muscle that beats in your chest. I'm talking about your emotional, mental, psychological, and spiritual self all weave together. The scriptures tell us, ask God for godly wisdom. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives all graciously and without reproach. It will be given to you. You have not because you ask not. Ask God, James 1 through 5, if you seek God, if you ask God, God will give you wisdom. How do I get it? By trusting God, by following the word of God, by placing the word within the center of my life. Look at the life of Solomon, who was known as the wisest man. He sought wisdom. He wanted wisdom. He had wisdom. He exchanged wisdom. Wisdom was the treasure that he sought. Wisdom was the knowledge of God that he sought. Read Proverbs 2 and 3. Wisdom simply means that you have enough humility and you become teachable and God can teach you not simply in a classroom, but God can teach you along life's journey. God can tutor you, tutor you, so humble yourself, get, humi get humility and become teachable and seek wisdom. And when you seek wisdom, God will fill up your cup. I was reading the book not long ago, and it's a book by Don Miguel Riraz. And it's called The Four Agreements, Don Miguel, and it's R-U-I-Z. And it's The Four Agreements. He says this in his book, and I recommend it to you. Be impeccable with your word. Don't make assumptions. Don't take anything personally and always do your best. Let me try it again, all four of them. Be impeccable with your word. Don't make assumptions. Don't take anything personally and always do your best. To me, he pulls together what this whole notion of wisdom is about. If you ask God, he says, if you ask God, then God would fill your cup. David said, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. And he says, ask God. Ask God in faith, verse 6, never doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For the doubter being double-minded, type it in, double-minded. Watch what he says. And unstable in every way must not expect to receive from the Lord. And so the father, the man who is seeking God ought to walk in grace, walk in humility, walk in wisdom, and lastly, not to be double-minded or to walk in faith and stability. Double-minded, double-minded. See, a double-minded person, James says, is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded person has two opposing views in the same space in conflict with each other. A double-minded person is inconsistent, vacillating, unable to make a decision, not sure how to act today or tomorrow. Jesus taught us that a house divided cannot stand. A double-minded person is a person that has two spirits, one pulling this way and one pulling that way. And if you take two horses and put them back to back and have them pull 
in opposite direction, you know exactly what happened. There is no movement. There is no movement. They are stuck. And there are too many people who are stuck, stuck in their lives, stuck in their business, stuck in their health, stuck in their relationship because they're double-minded. They're pulling in opposite directions. If you find yourself in that kind of condition, here's a few things that can help you move forward. First of all, get out of your own head. Get out of your own head and talk with somebody else and help and let them help you work through the double-mindedness. Then if that doesn't work for you, then get a journal, write it out. Not only talk it out, but write it out. Get it out of your head. Get it on a piece of paper and just release it and let it go. And then I want you to raise your awareness. Pay attention to what's happening around you. Pay attention to the conversations that you're having, not with somebody else, but the conversation that you're having with yourself. What is the story? What is the narrative that you keep telling yourself over and over again? And perhaps that's why you're stuck. Maybe you need to change the narrative. You got to turn the negative narrative into a positive narrative. You got to speak so that your speaking produces life and your life then has the power of God. Get rid of those negative thoughts. Get rid of that negative word and raise up your existence. Raise up your awareness. Talk about it in a way that lifts you and not pull you down. And lastly, if you want to get rid of a double-minded spirit, you've got to elevate. Somebody type it in, elevate. You've got to elevate your thinking. You've got to elevate your words. You've got to elevate your thoughts. You've got to dream again. Type it in, dream again. But don't dream small, dream big. Be like Joseph, dream big. Dream big. You've got to dream again and then take that dream and begin to move it into action. You've got to elevate your spirit. Don't allow the enemy to steal what God has for you. I'm getting ready to wrap it up. Now, here it is again. You need to move forward. You want to move forward. You got to move forward with your family, your relationships, your career, and your community. You got to press on to the higher calling of Christ Jesus. You want to become what God is calling you to do. How, pastor, am I going to do this? Walk in grace. Walk in humility. Walk in wisdom and walk in faith and stability. That's the opposite of being double-minded. You walk in faith. You walk in stability. You're not double-minded. You're stable. You're solid. You're whole. You're standing on the rock of Christ Jesus. Your mind is focused. You've got direction. You are not a double-minded person. Your mind is singular. Focus is focused on becoming what you envision that God would have you to do. Don't be double-minded. Clean up from the inside out. And when you clean up from the inside out, when your heart and your mind and your soul get in concert, you'll be surprised how the miracles of God will start showing up in your life. James says, we can say that faith and stability is the opposite of being double-minded. Remember the prophet Elijah? Elijah said, how long will you waver between two opinions? He told the people of Israel, you got to make up your mind. You can't worship God and then have idol and pagan gods. Uh, I, 
uh, Elijah said, how long are you going to be paralyzed by your indecision? Type it in, paralyzed by indecision. You can't make up your mind because you got a double-minded spirit. No, you got to move forward. You got to move past the paralyzing of indecision. Some people are paralyzed by analysis. In other words, they're so busy trying to figure it out, they never do anything. You got to move past the analysis and take it and put it into action. How long are you going to live as a double-minded person. A double-minded person, when you read in the original language, it simply means someone who's debilitated. It's like walking on two crutches. It's like having an injury. It's like having a physical disability. You can't run like you used to run. You can't move like you used to move because your mind is double-minded. How long will you be between these two decisions? Pastor, I want to move on. Here's what you do. Make up your mind. That's right. Make up your mind. Tell somebody, I got a made up mind. I got a made up mind. I'm going to walk in grace. I'm going to walk in humility. I'm going to walk in wisdom. I'm going to walk in faith. And I'm going to be stable. I'm going to be whole. People are going to be able to count on me. My family is going to be able to count on me. My wife is going to be able to count on me. My children are going to be able to count on me. My community is going to be able to count on me. I'm going to be whole. I'm going to be stable. It's time to grow up. Somebody hear me. It's time to grow up. It's time to move forward. Tell your neighbor, I've got a made up mind. I've got a made up mind. Type it in. I've got a made up mind. I've got a made up mind. Like Joshua, when he came to the end of his service and the people were divided, Joshua was one of the spies who went to Canaan and came out. He had experienced the goodness of God in the land of the living. Moses was now dead. He's leading the people. They're between two opinions. He says to them, listen here, y'all got to work this out for yourself. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you dwell. But he said this, Joshua, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I like that. But as for me and my house, type it in, we will serve the Lord. Live with a made up mind. Type it in, I got my mind made up. I got my mind made up. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. And there's no turning back now. There's no turning back now. There's no turning back now. I'm going to the kingdom. I'm in the kingdom. I'm walking in grace. I'm walking in humility. I'm walking in wisdom. I'm walking in faith, and I'm stable. I'm whole. I'm standing on the rock on a solid foundation. And as soon as you stand on a solid foundation, then you can help hold somebody else up so that they can depend upon you to help them make it through the chaos of this world. And so, beloved, walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Walk in grace. Walk in humility. Walk in wisdom. And of course, you're not double-minded because you're faithful and you're stable and you're whole, and you and I have 
a made up mind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for the blessing of Christ. And if there's one who's not accepted Christ, pray this prayer with me, Lord Jesus. I thank you for dying on the cross and I accept you as my personal savior. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. God bless you, beloved. Listen, thank you for joining us. If you're not connected with a church family, come on and share with us. Come on and help to make a difference. You need to be connected. Let us help you to find the foundation upon which you can stand. That foundation is the word of God. That is the word of God. Again, happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. And today, beloved, if no one told you, let me tell you, I love you. God loves you. You are somebody extraordinary. I want you to live to your higher self and not your base self. I want you to raise up. You can do it. And remember this day that you today are being called to walk in grace. Yes, you are. You're being called to walk in humility. You're being called to walk in wisdom. And you're being called to be faithful and stable. Thank you so much. I'm Casey Kimbrough, Pastor Kimbrough from Charlotte, North Carolina. And it's my joy to share with you. Much love to you and to yours. And Lord willing, I'll see you on next Sunday morning. Thank you for sharing with us.